show powered by the mighty enter talk radio networks in partnership with our good and fun show may the best brand win with scott robertson hey scott say hello hey my man how you doing we're, uh, we're, how's it going we're, happy we're, friday <laughs> yeah exactly right this is usually your, your time but uh we wanted to make a little bit of <laughs> special time for our guest who's really just making huge huge waves out there in the, in the music industry making some key differences and uh you know that's mr benji rogers from pledge music and uh he's got a number of different uh projects that he's got going on before we jump into the interview though i wanted to say thanks to our our sponsors pitbull audio at pitbullaudio.com Oh man, these guys are amazing. They are one of the the, the true, you know, spirited musician run uh, uh, retail outlets. So they they basically make sure that uh, when you get gear from them, they're going to be powering you for a lifetime because uh, they never want you to let go. And of course, we've got our good friends over at SIR at sir usa dot com. Uh, they are definitely out there making sure that uh, the touring musicians have all their backline and everything going on. And uh, uh, show. Showslinger. We've got uh, Paul Nicholas who has a show with us, and Showslinger is always doing a great job. And uh, last but not least, I wanted to let everybody know that uh, we've got a uh, a contest going on: the Nam Celebration uh, Ultimate Guitar Rig Giveaway. So if you go to entertalkradio.com, go to the link at the top left, you'll see where that uh, will lead you, and you can enter it in to win. But it's like five thousand dollars worth of guitar gear whether it be uh amp by supro a guitar by esp uh some pedals pedal train mission engineering uh uh strymon uh line six i mean there's just tons of them i can't remember all of them off the top of my head and pedal train is providing the board so uh you can be like the ultimate guitar hero right off the bat if you win that and it's only going all of it's going to one person so they're not piecemealing it out it's just one lucky person will get that and then our clinic happening next week with uh bunny Brunel, who was going to be at Pitbull Audio. So I just wanted to get all that out of the way. I know that's a mouthful. And uh, Benji, wanted to welcome you on board. Say hello to everybody. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Definitely, definitely, sir. Well, you know, we got a chance to meet over at the Summer NAM, you know, and that was a pretty awesome uh, pr- pretty awesome show. It's a little smaller than than, than uh, the Winter NAM, but uh, you were telling and talking about your, your company, Pledge Music. But, you know, yeah. before, before we jump into that, though, man, you know, we like people to know who you are because a lot of, a lot of our listeners are looking for careers in this, in this industry. And uh, you help, actually what you do, and we'll talk a bit about that later, you help to to get our projects funded but uh, you know let's start how did you get into the business where'd you where'd you uh you know uh find sure. the passion for it so, so I'm, I'm the son of three managers mother father and stepfather and my um ba- from from when i was a baby i was either at a gig somewhere in a recording studio so i was always surrounded by it and so a lot of my key friends contacts and, and whatnot were in the music industry I started making music myself, so I made uh, five albums, toured for about nine years, um, had uh, experienced what the whole city would call the massive highs and the crushing lows of the music industry. Um, and about eight and a half years ago, I just suddenly had this thought that if all music is funded by fans, why not let the fans pay up front? And then you don't have to go into debt to someone when you make an album. And um, sure enough, Mm -hmm. the idea kind of took on. And, um, you know, we're at the point now where, where, you know, the company's grown to about 50 people worldwide. Um, We've released, you know, worked with and helped fund thousands and thousands of projects. And uh, at first and foremost, I'm just someone who likes to solve problems. And I no longer play music um, the way that I used to. Um, but what I like to refer to is, is the companies and businesses that I'm building, whether it's Pledge or the, the dot blockchain music project, are basically like painting on a different canvas. Um, all of them at their heart, though, all the projects I work on, have to be solving a problem that gets artists paid. 
I'm obsessed by that. Um, you know, art, art, art is here to change the world and to make the world a better place. And uh, if the artists can't live and sustain themselves, they, um, it makes it a lot, a lot more difficult for them. And then the second side of it is, is that it always has to be the, the right mission, you know, and um, I'm not someone who believes that we should destroy the music industry and start again. I think we should work with what we have. I don't think anyone got to the top of the music business by being stupid. And um, I just, yeah, so uh, I just want to chip away at that. I'm a coffee drinker, a frequent flyer. I'm a father of a beautiful daughter named Izzy. And um, uh, my only other passion outside of that will be ice hockey. I'm a New York Rangers fan. Awesome, awesome. How's that? <laughs> that is awesome. Well, the first question I have is because I know you guys are going to the movies right after this uh, interview. What are you guys going to go see? <laughs> no, no. Uh, we actually do we do family movie night at home. Oh, so okay. It's popcorn and then iTunes. And, um, and my daughter w- w- wants to be a paleontologist. She's five. Um, and she wants to be a paleontologist, so it'll probably have something nice. to do with dinosaurs in it. <laughs> I hear Jurassic Park in the background, probably. <laughs> yeah, That's awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're also an educator too, right? You uh, you, you are uh, on staff over at Berkeley College of Music, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, I went to Berkeley, um, uh, uh, I'll say briefly, um, when I was younger, and um, uh, I picked up a lot of knowledge and a lot of friends, and I became aware of the online school through the brilliant, brilliant Mike King, who is the um, the head of marketing over there. And what I really saw was that there's this extraordinary... Um, with the online course, I could actually get to teach people from all over the world and get their perspective. Wow. Um, obviously, it's not my kind of full-time job. My, my full-time job is running the companies I run, but I've done, I've managed to be able to do one um, course uh, per, per term, as it were. Okay. Um, and what I found was – that um, a, I love to teach people stuff. I'm, I'm honored to do it. And B, um, I learned a huge amount from teaching. You know, re-explaining the things that to me are kind of second nature. You know, <laughs> it'd be how publishing licenses work, or, or you know, um, and so the course that I teach is digital trends and strategies. And the really amazing thing about this course is we literally look at articles that are written that day and discuss them. And you know, so because that's how the music nice. industry happens. It happens in real time. Um, so I'm, I'm honored to do it. And anytime you can impart some of the, you know, the blessings that you've had onto, onto other people, I, I see this as my duty. So yeah. Kind of reminds me of, a, uh, Scott has a segment called winners and losers in his radio show. Uh, not quite the same, but it almost reminds me because he put, pulls apart some of the news stories in there. I mean, what do you think about that, Scott? Oh yeah. It, uh, that, that segment just, uh, it just writes itself. I just, uh, I just, I sit back and. You know, just just like Benji was talking about, the um, news stories just come flowing at you. So you're like, yeah. "Wow, I can't, I can't believe that actually happened to human people." Look at that. Let's, <laughs> it's amazing. And, and the, the other thing that I found interesting is, is in the world that we live in right now, and let's not get too political, but like, you know, this idea of of like, like, you know, the way that like. Oh, that news story is clearly clearly just parroting a press release, or oh, that journalist is actually doing a bunch of work. Um, when you see the work being done, and you kind of get to the nitty gritty of how these stories emerge, it really does get interesting. So you know, there's yeah. a mm-hmm. yeah, I agree. Uh, in my spare time, I'm actually working on a uh, on a, um, uh, a an app that will uh, assist with the um, changing of fake news as well. But that's my um, uh, that's, a, that's a pet project, not for in stealth mode at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> again another one of these interviews where we have people who don't sleep <laughs> they just all they do yeah. is invent things and do things so i'm gonna you know, you, you, you cool. know it's, uh, just on that front though because because you know you said that people listening are kind of looking for that sort of entrepreneurial style is is this is this is the way i view it i only have one shot at this life there's only one I don't yeah. get to do it again. There's no kind of um, repeat. If we, we do believe in reincarnation and we come back, I'm going to come back to something else so I won't remember it. Like, And and I, I think to myself, binge watch Netflix or create something awesome. And the cool part is, is that in life you can you can do both if you if you you kind of arrange your time accordingly. And it's mostly it's about what you make time for. It's not what you find the time for. What you make time for. Like I make it. I make a Friday night commitment to sit with my family. We watch a movie. We eat popcorn. We order food. I make a Sunday ritual. We go to the diner, and I can still get my work done. And and um, I give up stuff like binge watching Netflix occasionally, but at the same time, you know, you making that time is so rewarding. And if you can make time to rehearse 
your instrument to write that song, you can make time to you know figure out how the music gets to people, and you can you can build the life that you want. And you know it's a rare and precious thing to be given a life and a body and a and, a, and an existence and like you know so so make the most of it you know and <laughs> have fun with it. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and uh, I kind of want to go back a little bit because uh, you, sure. you're definitely a, a man of passion. I mean, I would I would say that for sure. But uh, you know, when you first started uh, Pledge Music and you started to transition from being an artist into mm. being an entrepreneur. Although I would say, and I'd argue that you have to be an entrepreneur now as an artist, probably much like that then. But, uh, you know, one of the things, the trends that we're seeing is a lot of uh, players, artists are reinventing themselves and they have to learn to be business people as well as creative. So what was that transition like for you back then? It was rocky. Um, uh, I, I would find myself in meetings, particularly around the finance side of things, where I was literally Googling things in real time as they were happening. Like, you know, <laughs> someone would be like, you know, oh, yeah, I'm sure you've done your SWOT analysis. I'm like, SWOT analysis, <laughs> you know, like, um, <laughs> but, but, but I think what it's about is, and this is one of the reasons that I think that, that musicians and artists in particular are in a very unique situation here is um, we have a creative bit of our brain. And Oh, an accountant friend of mine said to me, he said, you know, there's 10,000 people that can do what I do, which is basically you follow a formula and you there, there's art to it in certain areas, but it's basically like pretty standard. But creating something from nothing is what artists do, you know. And so um, I found that 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 you must never my my my. my you know, again, it was difficult because I, I just didn't know, and I also didn't know how big this could get as well. That was the other thing was, you know, I'd never, I'd never had to lead people, I'd never had to deal with HR, I'd never had to deal with any of this stuff. It was brand new. And at the same time, I approached it very much like I would going into the studio for the first time, which is, I don't know how all well the bells and whistles work. But what I do know is, is you get great people in there to guide you and you never be afraid to ask the question. Never, ever, ever be afraid to say what you don't know, because the beautiful part is the world is full of hundreds of people who want to tell you what they know. Um, and you can learn a huge amount from by throwing yourself into the deep end. And I look at, you know, um, public speaking or the things that I've been able to do. I don't have a method. Other than, you know, throw the, throw the, you know, throw yourself off the cliff and, and build the plane while you're in the air. Um, it's an exhilarating ride. Things can go wrong, but they can also go very right. And, um, you know, just remembering that there is a creative part of your brain that can be applied to things other than just what you know um, is, is extraordinarily exciting. So I, I think that entrepreneurship is built into being an artist. Um, and that, um, it just requires switching your brain over to that channel, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, I hear you. I'm, I'm much like yourself. I, I started this, uh, this, uh, well, I started the radio show changing stage so to, uh, that we'd have space for me and my, uh, uh, my partner's band at the time. Uh, we, we partnered with the radio network, WS radio networks to, to create this show and, and work with Nam and all those other fun folks. And that's where we met Scott. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll do this for a while until the band takes off. And then all of a sudden I realized I could do more good for the industry by, uh, actually turning this radio show into a, yeah. a network. So we turned it a network. We've got 16 shows, Scott Robinson has a show on the network and i think your story is very much like that too as well scott you you uh, obviously had uh, been uh, the guy who'd helped to build brands and then all of a sudden you were your own brand yeah definitely it's uh you know it, i think i you know i agree with benji i you know i love the entrepreneurial lifestyle it uh i know it can drive some people crazy and some people just you know aspire to the the you know the feeling of safety and security of getting a paycheck and a W two form from one organization. But I think that also comes with the shackles of having to sit through a lot of, you know, forced fun activities like sexual harassment seminars and a bunch of stuff where I'm, where you're sitting there kind of going, is this the best I can do with my time and my life? This is, yeah. this is the choice that I decided to make right here. I mean, this is, yeah. this is as good as I can, as it gets for me. And so, you know, for, for me, I, I wanted something that was, that was going to be my own. And, uh, you know, when lose or draw, I wanted it to be, uh, you know, sort of, sort of driven by me. And, uh, and it's been great. My company's celebrating five years of, of being around as a, as a PR marketing branding firm, um, uh, next Thursday. So I'm, Congratulations. I'm, you know, I'm still here five years later, baby. So it's all, it's all good for me, you know? <laughs> well, that is, Absolutely. I didn't realize you've been around for five years. That's, that's pretty crazy. And, uh, uh, you know, 
I think mm-hmm. we all are tied to NAM somehow or another just because this industry kind of revolves around that, uh, that, sure. that convention a little bit, so, you know, just because what we do here. Um, you know, with, with that said, uh, w- I just want to kind of go back to our, our meeting there, Benji. Uh, what was your thoughts on, on the panel that you did there with, with the people? And what were, what were a couple of the questions that, that came up that you thought were pretty, uh, uh, you know, yeah. uh, that, that touched you a bit? So I'm super inspired whenever we get to talk to artists because most artists go into this sort of idea of direct-to-fan and crowdfunding being very skeptical. Um, And uh, the reason they're normally skeptical is because it used to be, this is how I get my music out. I I make my music. I, I go into debt make my music, deliver it to a label, label takes it to a distributor, distributor takes it to a digital service provider, digital service provider takes it to the people. And so the idea of short-circuiting all of that middle part of debt and layers and going direct is an interesting thing for them. And so what I remember from actually from, from our, our talk there was people saying, oh, wait, so I'm going into debt for no reason? And I could basically have my fans fund all this from the word go. And I'm like, yeah, you know, if you look at Pledge and Kickstarter and GoFundMe and Indiegogo, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. And if hardware companies are crowdfunding stuff, what makes you think it needs to exist in order to sell it? Like what about it being physically in the world or digitally in the world makes it more valuable? And a lot of those questions came up around that. Because a lot of times it's the managers who are like, whose job it was always like, right, artist is about to go in the studio. I've got to go find a, a, a label deal, right, based on these demos. That paradigm has shifted. Like, it's gone. And, you know, Zoe Keating, who's an amazing artist and performer, and I were talking yesterday, and she was saying, like, we have to forget and erase the idea that music is sold in units of of, of measurement in the way that it was. It's not anymore. Hey, Benji, and, I, I hate to yeah. interrupt you here. Mm-hmm. Uh, we are going into a, uh, a break here, so I want you to kind of cool. keep that thought. And uh, uh, at this uh, this next break, uh, uh, Scott's going to be steering uh, the, the, uh, the ship a little bit. But uh, you got I, it. again, I wanted to just remind everybody about the, the uh, since we've been talking about NAM, we, we, we uh, worked with and partnered with Pitbull Audio and uh, our good friends over at Mission Engineering to create this ultimate guitar rig giveaway. And I want everybody to kind of go on there. Uh, if you go to entertalkradio.com and check out the, the, the you'll see it says NAM Celebration to the, the top left. Click on that. Find out more about all the gear that's going to be given away. And, uh, you know, register to win because only one lucky person is going to win and you got a good shot. We'll be right back in a few short minutes. Going to pay, pay a little bit of the bills. And uh, uh, stay tuned for Benji Rogers of uh, are you serious about your music are you ready to run with the big dogs the experts at pitbull audio have the gear to get you into the game from leading manufacturers like mesa boogie fender pioneer and american audio to sound your best you need the best pitbull audio can deliver in rehearsal on stage and into the big time Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Brew. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Dimiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. 
My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday. <laughs> Welcome to the Changing Stage, music gear talk from the manufacturers and musicians who define the biz. Here's your host, Florentino Buenaventura. And you are tuned to the changing the the Marvel team up show of the Changing Stage and May the Best Brand Win. Uh, that we've, we've come together to uh, to talk with uh, the amazing Benji Rogers from Pledge Music and from a dot block music chain, and um, we're going to dig into a lot of that. So thanks for sticking with us here in segment two, Benji. How you doing no out there? No problem. No problem. Doing really well, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Well, I um, you know for this for this first segment, I wanted to uh, you know. Uh, one of my favorite go-to-market tactics is public relations. I'm a big believer yeah. in public relations. And obviously, uh, just today, you know, there's, um, you know, a lot of interesting news about the the press in our, in our country. Uh, there certainly right, is. <laughs> uh, the, the, and, 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 you know, obviously, um, you know, with, with the white house sort of at war with several major news media outlets and uh, blocking their access and that sort of thing, uh, which is not a good public relations strategy, in my opinion. Um, uh, I just wanted to, I want to talk to you about, you know, as far as Pledge Music is, is concerned, and how important are the press to you guys in terms of what you're trying to do, and and what kind of things do you do to uh, reach out and and um, and make connections sure. with journalists out there? So, so, so on, on the Pledge Music side, um, I spent we, we you know it's been an eight year build, and we obviously you know we were a small company um, in the context of titans like Kickstarter and Indiegogo, who would be like the major labels, and we were the indie, right? Um, right. Uh, we we never raised that much money, and so a lot of it was the key. Our our press strategy was you know. There are some amazing journalists in the music industry, um, people like Glenn, Glenn Peoples, Tim Ingham, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, Dan Rice from Billboard, who all sure. really kind of dug in. Chris Cook's another great one from CMU. Um, and what I like is when a journalist is kind of, you know, it, like it's a dance you do, right? I want you to tell the story as I've written it in my press release and you need to get the truth. So, um, <laughs> so, so as long as you understand that and, you know, we, we've worked with the press really well on pledge on the dot blockchain project, which is my current one. What's been so fascinating about that is I published everything to do with the project on medium. So there's nothing being done that you can't read about and understand the method of how to do it. And what was really fascinating about that was the press came to the project and a lot of them were like really fascinated by asking some tough questions. And one journalist in particular's questions were so needling and tough that I actually pivoted a piece of the product because of their helping out. And what was really funny was, is I would get emails like, you know, good luck with the project from some of my press friends. And I, and I'd write back to them saying, good luck. You're a part of this. We're going to need your help. Like, so <laughs> I, 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 you know, in one sense, I view it as an all boats rise situation. Um, but the PR on the dot blockchain project has been really, it's been the inverse of, of anything I've ever done because we've only done one press release and we've had hundreds of articles and interviews written about the project Nice, and it's because it's a larger open source thing. So, you know, I, I, and I have an amazing press guy I love out of LA called John Vlorton from Spin Lab, and he's been like kind of cool. the, the standby guy. You know, so there have been others I know, but yeah, it's um, it's 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 a it's a part of getting the word out, definitely. Great, great. Well, uh, tell everybody at, at home what uh, a, a, you know, basically what dot blo- dot blockchain music project sure. is all about. Yeah. So basically, um, today the music industry has no asset. And what I mean by that is if anyone makes a sound recording and they are, you know, so sound recordings have two pieces, a a written, a writer's part and a, and a performer's part. But those two pieces are never together, which means that if you spit uh, an MP3 or a wave out of a workstation to send to someone, (laughs) I can go Apple I and I can delete all the metadata from that. 
and no one would ever know because there's no trackability to the to the work itself. So it's like a house built on sand. And what we're going to do, or what, what we've built basically, is a wrapper that those audio formats go into, which contains the publishing information and the performer information in one place. So wherever that work travels around the internet, you always know who owns it, and most importantly, how to contact and pay them. And we're using a new technology called blockchain to um, allow that to happen because blockchain writes to a massive public distributed ledger so that everyone can see it. It's similar to the technology behind Bitcoin, but not the same. Mm. And, um, and as such, the reason I want to do that is because when an artist creates something, I believe that it should have a fundamental right of ownership. So if you're on Spotify and you double click on a song and you, you check out a song, it only shows you the label doesn't show you the publisher, the engineer, the songwriter, the bass player, nothing. It just shows you the label. And that's a, a hangover from Steve Jobs era. So what I want to do is make it so that when you, when you tap on the song in Spotify, you can open up all of the data of everyone who worked on it, the lyrics, what gear was used, when it was recorded, all of that hard-coded into the song itself so that wherever the, the song goes, you can never strip out the owners and what that means is for tracking payments and doing licenses, it becomes 10 times quicker because you don't need to go and hunt around. And you know, yeah. so, so, so as you move ahead, it's so, a way of basically leveling the playing field. Definitely. And that's for uh, obviously that's for, for, for files that are being transferred back and forth. Now, now, what do you think about this? This is a conversation I had with a, a, a friend of mine at the NAMM show. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I recently started subscribing to Apple Music. Yep. Uh, and, and, and I was a little bit skeptical of Apple Music, to be honest. But I'm a real fan. I have to say, the fact that I can just about... Uh, it's like... Um, it reminds me of Star Trek. You know where they just say out into the... Uh, they say out into the ether, they basically say, Computer, play me, uh, you know, ABBA, Dancing Queen. And the computer, like, does it, you know? Yep. That's Apple Music. It can play anything at any time... And it's the it's like the it's like every recorded piece of music known to mankind, and you don't ever have to, you know, quote unquote, own or download Jack yep. Squat. Yep. So and and, and yeah, and, and and so the challenge there is that the more streams that you get, the less that gets paid to those individual artists that, that you're listening to, because true. of the yeah, way true. that those the platforms work. And then the second side to that is. Apple's one thing, but what about Facebook? What about YouTube? Um, mm -hmm. So what you've mm -hmm. got is you've, you've got billions of dollars being distributed in a kind of like 75 to the majors, 15 to, so 85 to the majors, 15% to the indies. Mm -hmm. Level at the and at the label and at the digital service writer level. So the money's not reaching the right people. So Sure, Universal Music's making $4.3 million a day from streaming. That's great. But they're not getting necessarily just their money. They're getting other people's because of the way that these deals have been structured. And what it fundamentally comes down to is, is that you can't pay everybody in the value chain if you don't know who they are. And so, yes, Apple Music ah. is great. And I would actually argue that Amazon is going to kick Apple's ass this, this year because mm. I think 50 million of the Alexa and the kind of the, um, the echoes have been bought. And once you've tried this, this, this device, what you'll realize cool. is you don't even need to log yeah. into Apple because what you'll do is you'll say, Alexa, play the music and you won't care where it comes from. What I want to make sure is that the bass player that played on the track that you're listening to is getting his money or her money as it's owed to them, that the engineer who has points on the album is part of the publishing chain that pays out when that song is streamed on Facebook Live. Because at the moment, there is no way to do that correctly. It does not exist. It is paid huh. out in bulk black box payments. And that has well, thanks for. Well, thanks for taking care of the. Well, absolutely. Thanks for taking care of the bass player first of all, because they got enough problems on their own. You exactly. know, what I mean, just, uh, you're talking to two bass players here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it could be worse. It could be drummers. <laughs> oh, there you go. There you go. Oh, <laughs> not my first rodeo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we could do musician jokes for the whole rest of the show if we wanted to. That's well, true. um, it, it's just a bit, but, but I just just would do, do think about this. If you play on something as a bass player, right? 
how do you credit yourself on Spotify with that? How does the Spotify, if someone listening to it, man, I'd love to use that, use the a sample of that. How do they get in touch with you? It's impossible. Yeah. Right? I have no idea. And secondarily Probably to that, if it's remixed and put on SoundCloud and SoundCloud makes money over what you're playing, how do you, how do you receive something from that? If yeah. you're a writer credit on it. So, so yeah. again, if you don't know what's in the box, how can you monetize the box? Yeah, and yeah. that's the bit that I'm going for next. And I, you know, there's a there's a there's a side piece to that that's whole fair. thing too. Uh, we work a lot with uh, with college students. We're working with Berkeley. That's why I noticed that you were mm. uh, an instructor at Berkeley and uh, with UCSD. Actually, we are, are uh, got a number of students from UCSD that that work with us as well. And my point being is that uh, we learned when our, in, in in our age group we learned about uh, who the, who the players were because we had liner notes. And the yep. fact that we would have liner notes just to be able to to know who these players are, uh, yeah. you know, that, I think that's just that's hugely important because uh, mm. uh, you know nowadays we don't quite get that you don't know who's playing what, uh, you know, uh, we you know somebody was mentioning to me uh, uh, we need to get some of these young players in for clinics because a lot of the people that we have that are doing clinics are have been around for twenty thirty years. Yeah, and I'm like, well, who do you figure out who's playing on on tracks now? We don't know who's playing on the tracks because uh, if, if they're a corporate Band, they're probably not going to be doing clinics, and if they're you know they're side men, there's really hard. Yeah. It's hard to track who's, who and, the players and, are. And 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 worse than that, interesting. Because and just worse than that, just to kind of put a piece on that. One again, or the other reason I'm doing this is because if you were to write down that information into the MP3 or, or wave file itself, because it's in the session file potentially, right? And you were to you were to you were to put send that to me, I can literally go Apple I and I can delete all that metadata and start again. I can put my own information in there. There is no way to track it. Mm. And so, and, and one of the reasons I found this out was I'm listening to the, to the D'Angelo album, right? Yeah. And I'm like, who the hell is playing bass on this? This is monstrous. And I'm having to look at articles and I can't find it. There's nowhere to find out who played bass on it. I'm like, this is one of the best bass you know, albums I've heard in, in years for the bass how do I figure this out? And to this, and it ended up being a fourth review down in Google that mentioned who was in the studio. And I was like, ah. that's insane. Like, like <laughs> how can that not be part of the track? How can it not? It, 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 it is its DNA. Right. And so if we yeah. bind them together, we can, we can change the world. For bass players. Yeah. <laughs> yes, only for bass players. We don't care about all the other, especially those dang guitar players. We don't care about those guys. Those so guys, many of them. Yeah. There's yeah. Enough, there is enough light on the guitar players. They don't need any more. The bass player needs all the love and then some. They need hugs. They do. It's true. There's, it's true. there's, there's enough. Sting. He doesn't need any more love. He's fine. Oh, oh the guitar player is going to chime <laughs> in on this one. There's enough light on us because we know how to screw in a light bulb. We just hold, oh, the, light, we hold the light bulb up and we let the world revolve around us. Nice, 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 nice. Well, you know, I, the, the reason I mentioned the Apple Music thing too is, is, is I think that um, and it, I, I can't. Know, so it, I, it was Pino Palladino, oh. by the way. So, so just so you oh, know. Oh, oh wow, Pino, Pino Palladino. Palladino. Yeah. Of course it is. Right. Why, why yeah. wouldn't it be Pat? Pino? Pino's freaking amazing, man. We got to get him on no the show somewhere. on the network. When one of these shows. There you go. Anyway, one of the shows. One of the shows. On. Yeah. Well, I was I was just saying I can't imagine any conditions of which I would buy a, an album again. Yep. And, and I, why would I need to? And, 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 I, and I'm, and, 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 and let me answer my own question here <clears throat> because, uh, because I can listen to Bruno Mars 24 karat magic, uh, on any one of my devices, anywhere I want in my car, in, in my house, anywhere else. I don't actually own it, but I own uh, this subscription to it. And if I download it, I have to check this out now. I have to download it to my phone. Oh, it's a space concern. Oh, it's got a stick on this phone. Oh, well, you only have it here. So now you can't listen. You can't um, have it on this device. You can't have it on these other kind of things. You know, actually having the file is a huge pain in the butt, you know, yep. as opposed to actually being able to go computer, play Bruno Mars. And one yep. second later, the Bruno Mars song, the exact one that I want, it plays. And that's what yep. I want as a consumer. Yep. That's what, so, so the argument that I was having to get Nam or discussion that we were having at Nam was, um, you know, I, I'm not sure just seeing what I've seen from Apple music, that seems to be like exactly what the consumer wants. They want instant, yep. a near instant access to any title that they want without actually having to deal with any of the technicalities of downloading it or any of that action that has to go on. 
And I can't imagine why I would need to. I, I've been listening to Green Day Revolution Radio, which is a great album, but I <clears> listen <throat> to it on Apple Music. I don't actually so, so, own it. So, yes. So, so I'll tell you what's interesting is uh, I'll tell you what's interesting is 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 you know, and I, I've been you know obviously in the direct fan space. The average user on Pledge Music spends fifty five dollars per transaction, and what they hmm. mostly want to buy is something signed or something personalized. So the reason that you would buy music is if you could buy a sign personalized something, you know, a, a way to say that I was there. And, you know, artists have routinely left $2.6 billion a year on the table because fans mm. wanted to pay for certain things but not others. So um, – and I always say this. Never confuse music being sold badly with people not wanting to buy it. The fact that uh, you don't want point. to buy the music is absolutely fine. You're among the 87, 83% of people that, that want to just consume it, and that's all good. But here's the kicker. 17% of music consumers actually really do want to buy music, and they want to hmm. do so in order to support the artists. And the music industry has in every way, shape, and form completely and utterly failed to service them. Now, I'll give you an example. I fell in love with the Michael Kiwanuka album, Love and Hate. Just an extraordinary record. And there's okay. nothing for me to do. I can't buy a signed copy of the vinyl. I can't buy a test pressing. I can't buy posters, nothing. I can go to a website, maybe buy a T-shirt, and maybe buy um, some vinyl, but that's not what I want. And you, if you looked at my Pledge Music profile, you'd see that I buy signed test pressings, posters, handwritten lyric sheets, on and on. But because none of those are on offer, the most amount of money I can spend on him is to listen to it on Spotify, Tidal, iTunes, etc. And I'm a Tidal guy, right. so I've listened to it a bunch of times on Tidal. But at most, I'm giving him maybe 10 to 15 cents. Um, whereas for a band on Pledge Music, my other site, I spent 55 bucks on a signed piece of vinyl. So what's better? Um, a thousand people spending $55 on you or a thousand people giving you a quarter for streaming or both? Because that's the, the, that's the reality is, is again, there's 17% of music consumers identify as super fans and want more. But, but mm. if all you do is send me to Spotify or Apple, I cannot yeah. do anything else. I can't participate. Yeah. And that's how Pledge has been able to get its revenue um, for these artists is it's been able cool. to sit there and say, we unlock that for them, you know, so – yeah, I'm with you. Hey, Benji, man, it wasn't long enough, brother. I'm sorry that we have a, a short uh, interview here, but we have an important date night for you. So uh, we're awesome. coming down to the last minute here. Uh, let's get the <laughs> URLs, uh, URLs, how people can find out more. Sure. Um, uh, you, you can you hit me up on Twitter at B-E-N-J-I-K-R-O-G-E-R-S. That's Benji K. Rogers. Um, the project is the Dot Blockchain Music Project, D O T B L O C K C H A I N Music dot com. Um, and the Pledge Music is www.pledgemusic.com. Awesome, awesome. Well, Scott, hey, thank you for letting me uh, have a little bit of changing stage time during your normal hour. <laughs> and thank you for right all on, the man. Uh, stay tuned next week for May the Best Brand Win at this time. And uh, oh, yeah. uh, we will let you know when the next changing stage comes up. Thanks, Benji. Have a good one. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one-song mix offer. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beat, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. 
pitbullaudio.com. This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al Dimiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie's Groove.com. Ready to get your groove on?